In Pittsburgh, three firefighters die in the line of duty, bringing new urgency to the search for the cause of a mysterious blaze. Two suspicious fires strike East Baltimore in the same week. Perplexed investigators try to draw a connection To catch an arson suspect, investigators in Reno must rely on evidence from the crime scene. But what kind of clues could survive the 1400 degree inferno? When fire strikes, it's sudden, unexpected, and rampant, consuming almost everything in its path. But through forensics, arson investigators can piece together what's left and raise the truth from the ashes. Some fires start purely by accident. Others only seem that way. It's the investigator's job to tell the difference. In 1995, the urban landscape of East Baltimore was plagued by a series of mysterious fires. In July, Firefighters arrived at 1311 Rose Street to find the row house completely engulfed. No one was living there, but the fire claimed one casualty. A vagrant had taken shelter that night in an upstairs bedroom. The intrusion cost him his life. Rose Street Fire was the second lethal fire in the neighborhood in days. Less than a week earlier, neighbors reported a blast that tore apart a narrow building a few blocks away on Lombard Street. Bricks and debris flew 50 feet from the explosion. A woman who lived next door went into cardiac arrest as a result of the explosion and later died of complications. The Baltimore police and fire departments called in the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to examine the suspicious fires. Agent James Tanda led the investigation for the ATF. Uh, this was a massive explosion. Uh, these are three-story brick row homes on Lombard Street. Uh, that are contained on both sides. This unit happens to be in the middle of the block, and when it exploded, the entire building collapsed, and the fire was devastating. Uh, if there was anybody else in there other than the arsonist that day, they would have never survived this. Two suspicious fires, two structures reduced to rubble in the span of a few days. The ATF suspected they may have been connected to something bigger, over the past few years, 13 fires in nearby buildings racked up more than $2 million in damage. Now that fires had claimed two lives, the investigation took on new urgency. Fearing they were dealing with a serial arsonist, the ATF and the Baltimore Police Arson Squad sought to determine whether these blazes had been intentionally set and if any connection could be drawn between them. Baltimore arson investigator Mark Profili, a criminalist with the Baltimore Police, was assigned the case. People wonder oftentimes how you can take a bunch of rubble and find evidence, and we believe that uh, Fire doesn't destroy evidence, rather it creates it. So Bob there, Bob, we're gonna need some shots in here. Okay. 
This is where the guy's body was found, Sam. So. The victim of the Rose Street fire succumbed Somewhere to smoke inhalation in an upstairs bedroom. Face down on the floor, head toward the back door, the back window. Okay. But the fire had come from below and worked its way to the second floor. The investigative team's objective was to find out exactly where it started. Fire always marks its path. Smoke and burn patterns are the first clue at any scene. As the flames move through a building, they leave distinct patterns, which can lead a trained eye to the point of origin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Investigators need to know where a fire started before they can determine what caused it. It was a big fire. Okay, you were. Ready for a new angle? Yeah. Point of origin is that area of the fire, the exact point where the three elements of fire would come in, in together. That would be um, fuel, heat, and oxygen. And that would be the area from a forensic standpoint that we would look for the physical evidence of a flammable liquid residues being poured. What investigators found when they examined the floor was a circular area that had been burned much deeper than the surrounding wood. The pattern suggested that this was the point of origin. One, I can even say this suggests the person taking the gasoline and pouring it. would have been soaked with a flammable liquid, an accelerant, at this spot. Making her. The hard edge burning where the alligatoring effect of the wood stops is a good area to collect samples. It, this sort of defines where the pour would start and finish. Also, the burn through and the tongue and grooves would show us that probably a flammable liquid was poured here. Uh, uh, what makes me believe even stronger that it's a flammable liquid is if you can follow, you see the damage on the floor comes around and goes out, spreads all the way across here, which to me suggests that perhaps our arsonist poured some flammable liquid, small amount here, walked towards the front door, threw the flammable liquid in a large area, sets the can wherever, Lights his match and exits. As the investigation continued at Rose Street, the ATF called in a specialist. Tipper, a dog trained to sniff out traces of accelerant, set to work. She helps investigators identify similarities between arson fires by locating where flammable liquid was poured. With a sense of smell 200 times more sensitive than the human nose, these dogs can pinpoint minute traces of accelerant. Where's it at? Find it. See? See here. See here. Good girl. See here. See here. This drastically reduces the time needed to test samples collected randomly. Where's it at? Over here. Good girl. Good girl. When Tipper finds what she's looking for, she sits down and puts her nose onto the most saturated spot, telling investigators precisely what evidence to gather. Samples are then collected for analysis. Cut that up and fit her in the can. That's perfect. Accelerants ignite with devastating ease, but are reluctant to burn away. If the wood hasn't burned to ash, traces of the vapor will remain locked inside. Pine. This pine right now. Water from the fire hose actually seals it inside the material. In these scenes, we collected burned wood from the points of origin of the fires. We also collected any burned pieces of wood or clear pieces of wood that uh, Tipper, the canine, hit on. Okay. Sections of wood are carved from the remains, placed into paint cans, and firmly sealed to prevent evaporation. Oddly, Tipper kept 
kept hitting on a portion of the hallway that didn't appear to have been affected by the fire. Samples from this spot were sent with the other samples to the Baltimore ATF lab. In the lab, evidence cans are pierced and a pipette filled with activated charcoal is inserted. If accelerant is present in the sample, it is absorbed by the charcoal as it vaporizes. The charcoal is then tested for any traces of accelerant. Analysis confirmed that gasoline had fueled the Rose Street fire. Samples collected throughout the house showed that it wasn't just splashed lightly about. The arsonist had probably thought that more gas meant a bigger blaze. But that's not the way fire works. Though the arsonist had accomplished his goal, he was not an expert in the ways of fire. You have to have that fuel air mixture correct for the fire to burn at its peak as best it could. And they just put too much gasoline in. They didn't have maybe not enough windows open, maybe something, but they just had too much in here. One of the biggest clues was the unburned patch of floor found by Tipper. The ATF found traces of accelerant, but it was faint and far from where the blaze occurred. Show me. Someone had tried to torch this building before. Good girl. Could Tipper's curious finding put investigators on the trail of an arson ring? Center room. Tipped off by their canine specialist, investigators discovered that 1311 Rose Street had burned before. Two years earlier, the building's owner, Robert Milligan, had received several thousand dollars on a fire insurance claim. Any money on this? No, not to my knowledge. Baltimore police interviewed Milligan, a businessman who owned and operated a number of low income rental units. Serious as far as how? Well, it doesn't appear to have been normal. Uh, in he told the, the investigators that the fires may have been set by his tenants, who were angry yeah, over recent eviction care. notices. Mm. Quite a coincidence. Mm. Meanwhile, an investigation into the explosion on Lombard Street indicated that it, too, was oversaturated with gasoline. But in this case, the gasoline was spread with a bug sprayer found at the scene. The high concentration of aerosol gas is what caused the explosion. It seemed the arsonist had tried to refine his technique. The Baltimore Police Department's arson squad questioned residents, hoping to locate a suspect. Residents of Rose Street reported that they had been evicted just before the fire broke out. Neighbors near the Lombard Street explosion saw men moving furniture and files from an office in the doomed building, then moving in cheaper desks and cabinets. The more questions the police asked, the more suspicious and similar the fires became. My house was on fire, just like you knocked on my door. It was got us out of there. Looking through fire department records, detectives learned that too much gasoline had also been used to start a fire on nearby Bradford Street in June 1995, on Goff Street in April 1995, and on Linwood Avenue in October 1994. 
They were paid 13 over similar arsons had occurred in a two-mile radius in the past two years. Every fire fit the same profile. Too much gasoline poured in the middle of the floor. From the time they did Gough Street, uh, from it was in April of 95, until Bradford Street was just two months. It was April to June. And then from Bradford Street to Rose Street was within days. They actually literally went from June 28th to July 1st to July 4th to July 10th. So in a two-week period, they did five arsons and attempted to do five more. Besides their location and their fate, on the surface, the buildings had little in common. They were owned by different people. Months after the spree of fires ended, investigators hadn't closed in on a suspect. But they felt confident that all 13 arsons had been motivated by the same individuals. Now they had to find them. And what we tried to do was draw a link between this and all of the other scenes, and, and we were able to do that through their lab. We, we were able to find consistencies in how each one was initiated, as well as the accelerant that was used from scene to scene it was all consistent. Yeah, right. If this were an arson for profit scheme, it would take a massive paper chase to uncover it. Police and ATF started with a background check on Robert Milligan, owner of the Rose Street property. They learned he was in deep financial trouble. His businesses and rental properties were failing. His debt exceeded $60,000. Investigators researched every property that Milligan had ever owned. The names of known criminals kept cropping up as his business partners. The next step was to find out if any of these other men had buildings that burned. Using bank statements, corporate records, and fire department, police, and insurance reports, investigators slowly pieced together a string of insurance payoffs that linked Milligan and his business partners to all 13 fires. But who was actually striking the match? The investigation revealed that one of Milligan's business associates was recently imprisoned for robbery. Agents went to the Maryland Correctional Institution to interview him. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he admitted his involvement in the arson for profit scheme. He named another business associate, Paul Beber, as the torch. Beber had been injured in the Lombard Street explosion, he said. The informant told police that Weber had modified his usual pattern, using a bug sprayer to saturate the Lombard Street house. He thought it would be a quick job, but he underestimated its power and was temporarily trapped in the flames. Weber managed to escape and flee with the help of Robert Milligan's brother, Gary. crawled out of the rubble with uh, second and third degree burns and crawled back through the alley to the awaiting getaway car. Uh, at that point, Gary Milligan then picked him up and took him back to his house where they tried to doctor him before he went to the emergency room. As soon as Beber was released from the hospital, he went into hiding. He was eventually flushed out, apprehended, and arrested. To the getaway vehicle. He was surprised, uh, very surprised that he was caught that it was over. He was very surprised. He, he had been running for so long and had led a life of crime since he was uh, 16 years old that uh, at the age of 32 to be apprehended knowing that he was charged now with arson, conspiracy, attempted murder, and a bunch of other crimes, he knew his life was essentially over. To close the case, the ATF had to find a way to link Robert Milligan to the arson scheme. A sting was set up. In this surveillance video, He's discussing the arson with his former business associate, 
who cooperated with authorities under condition of anonymity. Everything's cool, right? Yeah. Well, with me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, can you find out if with Bundy if anybody knows anything about me, if anybody's listen come to, to me. see listen, me? Listen, listen to me carefully. Uh, they told Paul that uh, that they know that I'm the mastermind behind it all. It was all the ATF needed. We baby, we ain't going nowhere. Man, I, baby, I don't care. Baby, no, no, no. Uh -uh. Police learned that Milligan hired men to evict his tenants a week before the Rose Street blaze. Once he was certain the house was clear, Beber set the fire. Milligan didn't count on a vagrant becoming trapped in the building. Milligan even had police on his payroll to ensure that his people would not be caught. But in the end, his arson for profit ring collapsed. In November of 1996, federal indictments charged Milligan and his five co-conspirators for their roles in one of the largest serial arson for profit cases in Maryland history. By April of 1997, all the defendants had pleaded guilty to arson, conspiracy, and federal firearms violations. The judge doled out stiff sentences, ranging from 17 to 24 years in federal prison. Milligan and his associates tried to cover their tracks, hoping that the power of the fire would destroy any link to them. But forensics had connected the 13 seemingly unrelated fires with the people who masterminded them. Had it not been for good police work and effective lab analysis, their elaborate arson ring might have never been exposed. Other arsonists are less methodical, but catching them can be equally challenging. On November 18, 1992, firefighters from the Reno, Nevada Fire Department were called to a large fire. The blaze tore through the Mental Health Medical Association building. It took firefighters more than 10 hours to conquer the blaze. The fire destroyed the three-story building and the expensive medical equipment inside. The intensity of the fire seemed suspicious. Forensic investigator William Stevenson was called in to photograph and examine the wreckage. This would be one of the first photographs taken at the scene. It's an aerial photograph of the actual building itself. The area just to the west of this porch or towards the residence itself uh, was the area that the fire investigators indicated was the possible point of origin for this fire. Once the fire had been extinguished and the building declared safe, Fire Inspector Bill Burney explored the aftermath. He suspected an accelerant had been used. And I thought it was highly unusual to have so much water on the porch to see flames uh, burning on top of the water. A typical house fire burns around 800 degrees. But judging from the burn patterns and amount of damage, temperatures at the entryway reached 1,400 degrees. Neither an electrical fire nor spontaneous combustion from oily rags would have produced these patterns. They were clearly signs of an accelerant. They included a well-defined pour pattern and severe alligatoring, indications of intense heat in a short time. Bernie and Stevenson looked for something to link the arsonist to the crime scene. 
Despite Stevenson's careful documentation of the fire damage, no compelling clues surfaced. The destructive capabilities of the fire uh, had actually burned up a lot of evidence. And when I left the scene that day, we had virtually no physical evidence to connect a suspect to that scene. That wasn't surprising. The intensity of the blaze made it impossible for firefighters to enter the building. So the order came to flood it from the outside. After a 10-hour dousing with thousands of gallons of pressurized water, most of the accelerant had been washed away. Investigators focused their attention on the front door, the apparent epicenter of the blaze. Near it was a shattered window. Bernie suspected that was where the arsonist poured the accelerant. I determined that the point of entry, the, how the fire was set, is the suspect used a flammable liquid container, probably a two-gallon or five-gallon gasoline, and broke a window and used this motion to pour gasoline through the, this window, therefore possibly cutting the back of their hand or some portion of their hands. If Bernie was correct, then whoever broke the window may have been cut in the process. Could the arsonist have left blood at the scene? It seemed unlikely. Even if he had been badly injured, the evidence would have been washed away or covered with grime. While the investigators scoured the building for clues, their big break came from across town. Investigators Bernie and Stevenson were frustrated by the lack of evidence at the Mental Health Association building in Reno. Fire started way down here low, so that's another indicator. Well, gonna... But just well, as they finished their inspection, they learned about a shooting at a mental health facility in another part of the city. Doctors who had offices in the burned building also worked in this facility. From interviews with personnel, the investigators zeroed in on a suspect in the shooting, James Thomas Manassas, a 57-year-old cab driver who lived five blocks from the fire. His wife, a psychiatric patient, was institutionalized at the facility. He believed that after two years, she was only getting worse. She has been making great strides. I want her to come home. Calm down. She has to come home. Growing frustrated, he directed his anger at the doctors, whom he considered responsible for his wife's decline. I'll take care of her. Calm down, sir. I will take care of you. your wife. He demanded that his wife be released, or he threatened to take matters into his own hands. Doctors refused. For nearly two years before the fire, Manassas continued pressuring doctors about his wife's care. According to one of the psychiatrists, Manassas made death threats and promised to burn down the building. On November 18th, just five hours after the arson at the mental health offices, someone had fired two shots through the windows of the mental health facility, wounding two doctors. Whoever fired the shots fled without being seen. From where you were standing, what did you see? Police decided to take a closer look at James Manassas. Officers went to his house and found him bleeding heavily. Both of his hands were severely lacerated. He was brought to police headquarters for questioning. Manassas claimed that he was wounded with a knife during a mugging the previous night. So you really We went out to this location in order to try and verify the fact that he had indeed been attacked here. 
and look for possible physical evidence of that attack. When we arrived at the area, we did a very close examination and we did not find any blood anywhere around this particular location. Look at here. Yeah, that's a nice picture there. Let's get a shot of that. Armed with a search warrant, investigators returned to his house. They found a streak of blood on his car door and several spots of blood inside the vehicle. In the house, they found that Manassas had made no effort to conceal the copious amounts of blood. Oh, we got some blood here. Get a shot of this. In the kitchen, they found blood at the bottom of a bucket. bedroom, they uncovered oh, bloody blood pants and a bloody towel. Oh, yeah. Given his suspicious wounds, weak alibi, and ardent threats against the mental health care facilities, the police felt they had enough cause to arrest him. Bernie and Stevenson believed they had the arsonist in custody but they knew that they didn't have the kind of physical evidence that would assure his conviction. There had been no eyewitnesses to the crime, and no accelerant was found on the suspect's clothing. But his wounds raised suspicions. In reality, Reno PD detectives uh, believe that these lacerations were actually caused uh, by the action of the broken window glass to his fingers at the fire at the point of origin. The only physical evidence to connect him with the scene of the fire would be blood from his wounds, if it survived the inferno. Stevenson was familiar with a laboratory technique in which bloody fingerprints are baked to stabilize them. Was it possible that a viable droplet of blood had been preserved by the intense heat and survived the water and soot? Right by his left foot all the way over to the door. It was a long shot, but at this point, it was all they had. Well, because of all of the hundreds of thousands of gallons of water that had been used on that fire, the actual damage by the heat and flames, damage by the char and the residue and the items falling from the ceiling and such, we were a bit skeptical as to whether we would find some blood evidence at that scene. If there was any blood at the scene, it would have been baked into the concrete. The investigators removed six inches of burned debris. Then they gently washed down the front porch. As layers of wreckage were moved, a series of brown droplets that appeared to be blood became visible. A marker was placed on each drop. The blood droplets led from the shattered glass down the porch steps. Not knowing how much of the blood would yield helpful information, they collected as much of it as they could. Removing the samples wasn't easy. Normally, blood is collected with moistened cotton swabs, but these droplets were much less accessible. The team had to use a scalpel to scrape it from the concrete. The only hope of catching an arsonist was to find his signature in these charred flakes of blood. There it is. The blood samples collected from the burned steps of the mental health building were sent to the Washoe County Sheriff's Office crime lab for analysis. The serology department did a preliminary examination to confirm that the blood was human. The specimens were then sent to criminalist Rene Romero to determine if viable DNA could be extracted from them. We really didn't expect to get results. The stains um, themselves looked like something that came from the bottom of a charcoal grill. And um, high heat is something that can ruin DNA. In fact, the heat had been very destructive. 
But despite temperatures in excess of 1,400 degrees, Romero was able to extract DNA from three of the 11 samples. The next step in profiling the blood droplets was RFLP, the most complex DNA test. It's most often used when the sample is in bad condition or is too minute. By exposing the DNA to radiation and using a series of radioactive tags, a DNA profile can be determined. The test took three months to perform. The RFLP process worked on only one of the three DNA samples. The bar pattern it generated was then compared to that of the blood drawn from James Manassas. Was one in 500. Romero's statistics estimated that the frequency of this particular genetic pattern is one in 500,000. The population of Reno is just over 80,000. The slim but powerful DNA evidence had survived the crucible of a devastating fire and bound James Manassas to his hostile act. To Bernie's way of thinking, Manassas was a man who wanted attention for his crime and sympathy for his wife. It seemed like he was a man with an agenda. Basically, I think he was playing with us or myself to to see how long he could prolong uh, being arrested, and he wanted to be noticed. He was a vigilante. He wanted everybody in the world of the city of Reno to, to think that his wife, who was being treated at the uh, mental health facility, wasn't being treated correctly. For his crime of arson and the shooting attack on the clinic, James Manassas received 76 years in jail. With a gallon of gasoline and a match, Manassas's stunt evolved into an enormously costly crime. Totaling four and a half million dollars. Fortunately, the fire claimed no victims. The ultimate price is paid when fires turn fatal. Shortly after midnight on February 14, 1985, the Pittsburgh Fire Department was dispatched to 8361 Bryceland Street. Captain Thomas Brooks, firefighter Patricia Conroy, and firefighter Mark Kalenda entered the house and made their way down a staircase to the basement. When the stairwell collapsed, they found themselves trapped with no apparent way out. The intense heat and blinding smoke prevented them from finding an exit. Their hose burned in half. Their radios failed. As the fire continued to rage, the oxygen in their tanks ran out. It took several hours to extinguish the blaze and evacuate the fallen firefighters from the incinerated home. Brooks, Conroy, and Colenda could not be revived. None of the Buckner family who rented this house were injured in the fire. Because the fire turned fatal, the Pittsburgh Fire Inspector contacted the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Special Agents Dan Bay and his partner Bill Petratus were assigned to the case. Anytime you have a, a, a situation where three firefighters die or a firefighter dies, it's a very high priority with uh, ATF as far as the investigations go. They requested us in the early part of the uh, investigation, actually right after the fire, to uh, make a determination on the uh, cause of the fire. The agents tried to discover how these firefighters had died. The house, typical of the Pittsburgh area, appeared to be two stories from the front, but was actually four stories built into a hill. This layout contributed to the firefighters' disorientation. 
they failed to notice their passage to safety. They didn't realize that this door could be opened. They thought it was a dead-end closet, so this access was blocked. Their exit route, following the route they used to come in, was blocked because of the collapse. Blinded by smoke, the firefighters felt around the walls, searching for exit windows. When they couldn't find any indentations, they believed they were trapped underground. What they couldn't know, as their air supplies dwindled, was that the room had several windows, but they had been weatherproof and covered with heavy plexiglass. The fire was too hot for other firefighters to come to their rescue, and there was no way to contact them. The three firefighters could not be saved. Investigators now had to determine how the fire started. ATF agents surveyed the wreckage. The majority of it was in the basement and attic. This suggested that the fire began in the basement. Then, having extinguished all combustible materials on that level, leapt up to the attic through the spaces between the walls. The absence of frayed wires or damage to the inside of the washer, dryer, water heater, or furnace dispelled the theory that the fire could have been sparked by an electrical glitch. A pile of charred laundry sat in the middle of the soaked floor. When investigators turned their attention upwards, they noticed an odd burn pattern directly above the burned laundry. The marks aroused the suspicions of investigator Dan Petratus. The joists of the ceiling were burned out in a circular pattern that was probably about 12 feet in diameter. That is unusual. So that was one of our early indicators that something occurred in the basement that wasn't typical of a naturally occurring fire. To understand the fire's progression, the ATF team relied on a series of mathematical formulas. By plugging the values for burning textiles into the formula, Petratus determined that a pile of laundry of that size would generate 176 kilowatts of energy. That figure was then factored into a flame height formula. It calculated that the maximum flame height would be only two and a half feet. The flame wouldn't even reach the ceiling, let alone leave such a large burn pattern. So when we look at a particular fire scene and we interpret the patterns, then the next question we ask ourselves is, does the fuel load that we find in this room have enough energy to create the patterns that we're observing. We need a flame height. Even if the laundry were piled up to the ceiling, it wouldn't create a great enough flame to mushroom out and ignite the joists simultaneously. But factor an accelerant into the equation and the picture changes. The calculator says uh, 1,300 kilowatts. By adding a single gallon of gasoline to the laundry pile, the flame height increases to 13 feet. This model fit the burn pattern on the ceilings and the joists. There was no way that a laundry pile could fuel a fire powerful enough to burn the ceiling unless it had been enhanced with an accelerant. When we plug in a material that has the characteristics and energy of gasoline, then that particular material will create the patterns that we have observed. Petratus had located the origin of the fire and determined that an accelerant had been at work there. But collecting evidence to prove his case would be difficult. Burned shreds of laundry had been soaking in water for hours. The basement floor was made of concrete. 
because it's non-flammable, no, it doesn't no, yield a discernible pour there. pattern. That's enough. Why don't you get that back to the lab? If this case were to be solved, the story would be told in the lab. The ATF lab in Rockville, Maryland was called upon to analyze samples of laundry, wood, and some cement chips from the floor of the house that burned in Pittsburgh. Forensic chemist William Kennard examined the debris from the fire for traces of accelerant. When a fireman sends us some debris, uh, and he's looking for an accelerating compound, and he petitions us to try to find this accelerating compound from the debris that he sent in. So we use the charcoal strip method. The test involves the insertion of a charcoal coated strip into the canister held in place by a magnet. The can is then heated to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If hydrocarbon molecules, the main compound of accelerants, are present, they are captured by the charcoal. The strip is dissolved in carbon disulfide and the resulting solution is injected into a gas chromatograph. The instrument displays a chemical profile of the substance. Kennard then compares the pattern of peaks and valleys to a standard for evaporated gasoline. If the patterns match, gasoline is present on the sample. Kennard found remnants of the accelerant in six of the samples from Bryceland Street. His identification of gasoline in the pile of laundry corroborated the scenario of arson. A fire started when a pile of laundry on the basement floor had been doused with gasoline and ignited. Now, the investigation focused on finding out who did it and why. And uh, your name? Catherine. The ATF first questioned the homeowner but he had nothing to gain by the destruction of his home. The ATF suspected that the Bryceland Street fire might have been gang-related, but that seemed a dead end. They then contacted Ronald and Darlene Buckner, who rented the house. The focus soon turned to the Buckner's daughter, Catherine. When we looked into her background, she had uh, been involved with two other residents in the past year and a half that had basement fires. So she became a very strong suspect. And uh, we uh, considered her for probably six to seven months uh, of investigation before she was eliminated as the, uh, the suspect. As they continued their investigation, the ATF learned that the Buckners aspired to buy a house. In the summer of 1994, Ronald and Darlene had gone to look at homes with several real estate agents. In October of that year, they inquired several times about purchasing houses, but were turned down each time because they couldn't afford a down payment. In November, after five years without coverage, the Buckners took out a renter's insurance policy on the Bryceland Street house. Only three months later, the house was gutted by fire. The insurance company paid $20,000 on their claim. What the company failed to notice was that the day after the fire, the Buckners resumed their house hunting with new enthusiasm. As soon as they received a check from the insurance company, they put a down payment on a new house one that they'd been eyeing since the previous year. A motive was taking shape. Investigators grew increasingly suspicious of Darlene Buckner and her son, Gregory Brown. Darlene said that on the night of the fire, she and Gregory had gone grocery shopping. They returned to find her house engulfed in flames. Yet neighbors had seen Gregory Brown standing outside his home, watching it burn. 
even before emergency crews were on the scene. Another neighbor had seen Darlene driving her car near the grocery store alone that night. Shortly after the fire, Gregory had been arrested on drug charges. He had served 90 days. ATF agents interviewed his cellmates. They told the ATF that Gregory bragged about setting the fire that killed three people and landed his family in a new house. Yeah, actually showing that uh, the, uh, the temperature... The ATF filed and... charges against yeah, Gregory you know, Brown really, and Darlene you know, Buckner. All the scientific evidence that, pointed to arson. Fire setters unleash a force far beyond their control. By dropping a match in a gasoline-soaked pile of laundry, Gregory Brown set in motion a chain of events that claimed three lives. The jury found Gregory Brown guilty of three counts of second-degree murder, two counts of arson, and insurance fraud. He was sentenced to three consecutive life terms in prison. Darlene Buckner was found guilty of insurance fraud, but was acquitted of the other charges. She was sentenced to three years and probation and fined $5,000. Defying the arsonist's intentions, a history of the crime is forever etched in the scorched and blistered rubble left behind. Through computer modeling, trained dogs, chemical analysis, and astute observation, forensic investigators are able to reconstruct the crime and read the story from its ashes.